we know that genetic factors are important in the development of dementia. And they're most important in the early onset dementias. So people who have developed dementia in their 50s or 60s, there's an interaction between those genes and the environment, which might be very important. So one of the most, you know, talked about, because it's actually a really important gene, is APOE, of which all of us have two. Um, there's an APOE4 is associated with increased risk of dementia. Um, and so if you have two of those, you're actually much greater risk of having dementia. It doesn't mean it's definite. If you have these two, what do you call them, E4 genes? It's what does about that mean? eight times greater risk. Okay, double. so that sounds pretty yeah. bad. How And how many people will have two of these Ooh, E4? Oh, not very many. So I think it's um, you say about 25% of the population have one. So there'll be a couple of percent of people, like two or three percent people listening to this who could have both, and their risk really would be much more because eight times higher on something that's relatively common sounds like that's a very high risk yeah so that and that's one of the but reasons, you're saying they're not yeah. doomed to get this if they have these two no, no, genes absolutely not yeah well we don't actually know completely why apoe4 confers the risk but it's something to do with the way that our brain cells um use um fats in the body and it's probably influenced by things in our diet and maybe medications that we take. So that's why, you know, you can still increase your resilience even if you have two of those APOE4, Alex. What are the other things that um, mean that people are at higher risk of dementia? Well, if we start like early on in life, um, really important because ultimately all of our cells in our body are aging right from the beginning when we're after we've conceived. Um, so, you know, even things in utero can be really important for later life development. This is while I'm a f yeah, while I'm a fetus. Yeah. So, so if you're any pregnant mums out there, okay. you know, actually, you know, what you're doing is preparing your child for the whole of their life. I mean, that's really a key message for society. We need to really look after pregnant mums. That seems unobvious. How does what a, happens to me as a fetus affect? What are the things that will change my risk of dementia? It's about cognitive reserve. So that's the kind of maximum cognitive ability that we might have, not just in terms of sort of intellectual ability, but also psychological um, state as well. So the reason why that's really important for dementia is, is that dementia is something whereby our functions are interfering with daily life. And obviously, if we start off with really high functioning, then we get to that point much later in any disease process. So you can put off significantly the time at which you fall below that threshold of being able to function in daily life. Much, could, much later. Could you explain a bit more what you're d describing? What is it that some people are getting and other, um, other people are not? We can think about it from multiple different ways. Yeah, We can think about it in terms of the stimulation that a child is being given um, through education, through parental influence. We can think about it psychologically around that that development um, that's happening in early childhood. But we can also think about it about nutrition, as we talked about you know, before, I'm sure we'll talk about again. Uh, nutrition starts in utero. There are factors, factors which affect how the brain actually develops right from the beginning. And then you know, we can then go even further than that and talk about things like smoking and alcohol, which have significant effects on the brain development of children. I think I'm understanding um, better now. I think you're saying, Right back, even when you're as a fetus, depending upon like the nutrition that your mother is having, that's going to affect the way your brain is developed. Then after you're born, continuing the food that you eat as a child, but also you're saying the stimulation you get. I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that. You're saying that somehow the way that the world is interacting with you is going to give me a, I guess, like a healthier and more robust brain that is actually going to have an effect on whether I get dementia 70 or 80 years later, is that? You might still get dementia, but humans are incredibly varied in terms of their, uh, you know, cognitive functioning. Um, and so if you have a high cognitive functioning, obviously um, you've got further to fall. Could you talk a little bit more therefore about this? Because I think everyone listening to this is probably thinking, okay, how do I make sure that um, maybe starting with perhaps thinking about their children or their grandchildren, how do they make sure their reserves are good? And then also... Um, you know, perhaps what's happening later. But right now, I think you're talking about like earlier life. What is it that gives you these higher reserves, bef you know, before you're 18, I guess? Yeah. So so I think we, we've, we've already talked about diet. We've talked about intellectual stimulation, sort of also that stability, psychological balance. 
mental health is really interesting because it en- ends up it, good mental health sets you up for a cascade of of, of good things that are then happening to you late in life, which then give you more opportunity, more capability to take on these opportunities to then um, improve your brain reserve and stimulate your brain. Whereas um, problem, problematic or ment- mental health then can lead to difficulties in ca- the capability or the opportunities and motivations to take on these things that are going to then help your um, future brain reserve. So, so talking about some of those i mean the key things are around social stimulation um uh you know um things like physical fitness i think i talked to, about that a lot in the last podcast that we know that that physical fitness is really beneficial for brain health and of course we can then put in some physical reserve as well and habits of daily life that then increase our physical activity and continue it going through midlife which is going to be good for vascular health but it's also really good for brain health so if i am doing more physical activity what does that mean for my brain the habit is good it's the it's the daily regular um physical activity which doesn't need to entail exercise um it's the um, reduction, even in sedentary time, that we see has an effect not just on dementias, but actually on brain aging as well. But not just in terms of physical activity, active in terms of social activity, and the, all those things, those all contribute to brain reserve. But then there's also things that sort of, you know, alter brain reserve and make it more tricky for us to maintain those cognitive functions. I'm not talking about the proteinopathies now, I'm talking about the the reserve capacity. And of course, there that's where interaction with other body systems is really important. So we know that there's a real strong interaction between cardiobiotic health and brain health. We know that there's a really strong interaction between, um, say, for example, um, uh, our hearing, our hearing ability, our sensory ability, and brain health. Then likewise, infections can can tip the balance of brain health, but chronic inflammation can also affect how our brain's resilient um, to those changes which might happen in that balance between proteins being set down or not. So before we start to talk about prevention, which I, I know everyone listening is like, that's really interesting. Yeah, it all sounds quite scary. Let's talk about everything we can do. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about symptoms and what the status of treatment is at, at the moment first. So. Could you tell me if someone's thinking about the symptoms that they might notice in themselves or a loved one that would sort of probably trigger this thing that I think, you know, we should maybe go and talk to a doctor. What should they be looking for? So really, it's about a change in, in cognitive function. And different dementias have different patterns. But as I've talked about, you know, we've, we've got things like Alzheimer's dementia, which starts with short-term memory loss. Um, there's other um, forms of dementia that can start with Um, personality change. Um, Again, further forms of dementia, actually the first presentation is around falling over and maybe um, uh, difficulty with the blood pressure regulation, um, sleep even, um, sometimes can be the very earliest presentations of some forms of dementia. When those symptoms start to become become common enough that you might be sort of on the uh alert for it because again i i think many people listening to feeling like ah oh, as people get old i'm i'm expecting this to happen and i'm sort of on I become very vigilant about it hmm, good question so most people that are referred to my memory clinic are probably in their 70s okay it's quite rare to see people in their 40s being um, being referred to me um if people do have these pro- these problems happening in their 40s then they're more likely to go and see a neurologist uh, for an examination and so what are the treatment options? And I think um, I've definitely seen there's been a lot of press about new drugs starting to come on board. Um, what, what's, the, what's the situation today as, as a doctor thinking about treatment for somebody who comes in and who you do diagnose with dementia? Yeah, so it's really exciting that we now have some new drugs because we've been waiting actually about 20 years for some new changes in drugs. And what, what these drugs are doing, actually, it's a really amazing proof of concept that um, these medications, they're basically antibody-based medications that are sticking to the proteins and getting rid of them, clearing those proteins that we talked about at the beginning. Um, and Sounds we know, good. Yeah, yeah. We, we've known for some time, actually, that we can do this and take them out, for example, from, um, from animal studies. Um, it's only really been in the last year that we've 
had evidence that um, taking out those proteins in the case of Alzheimer's uh, disease actually has an effect on human progression of the disease. But the issue is that actually when we do that, the level of gain is actually quite modest. It doesn't... You mean when someone takes these drugs? Yeah, so we can take the take the, the proteins out of the brain. Right. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we've significantly affected their cognition and their function. We hear about all sorts of wonder drugs, right? That suddenly solve everything. Um, and then you hear about other drugs where people say, oh, well, it doesn't really, you know, ultimately didn't really make much of a difference. So, so How excited the, yeah, so, are you so, about Well, I'm excited in principle. I'm excited okay. in principle because we've shown a proof of principle that this works in humans and therefore it could be developed on. Um, but the issues are this, that first of all, the gain over a year is only a few points on a cognitive measure. So it doesn't get. It doesn't mean that the person then doesn't have dementia. It's just that okay, their so they're dementia not cured. is. They're not. They're not cured. They probably are. The, you know, the process is slowed though. That's the new. That's the the game changer. The process is slowed, whereas before we've been able to give drugs that manage symptoms, but ultimately the process isn't slowed. So that's the really exciting game change. How much slowing down are they delivering? Yeah. So at the moment, not very much slowing down. Okay, so that's but not but but, but so we ideal. haven't we haven't t- talked about the main problem with it. Okay, the main problem is is that actually there's increased risks. So as you're taking away the proteins from the brain, okay, you're also increasing the risk of edema happening in the brain so that's that swelling mean? swelling in the brain okay which can be quite catastrophic if the brain swells a little bit there's inside a, a fixed space there's an increased risk of hemorrhage little micro hemorrhages within the brain and so people that that's, are having that's these bleeding, drugs, isn't it? It's bleeding yeah so the people that are having these medications have to have a scan every month and so what does that mean in reality there because those sound like quite scary side effects are they well, so Very it, rare, mean, are they quite it, it means common. that um, yeah. actually the balance of risks and benefits is not totally clear, ultimately. So as a um, doctor, does that mean you're not necessarily just saying to everybody who comes in, you should well, take this drug? Well, they're not, they're not approved in the UK okay. for that reason. I and they have been approved in the States? They've been approved in the States, yeah. Okay. But and normally when that happens, that, that tells you it's a bit on the edge. Is that what you're saying about the balance of benefit and... I think the um, benefit and risk is definitely on the edge if you had all the resources available and then you've got to think, well, actually, how are we logistically going to get everybody to be able to have scans every month? And what knock-on effect is that going to be on being able to get can- scans for cancer or scans for other things? So there's a resource issue as well. 